Well, we're back into our look at the first epistle, epistle of John. We left off with verse number 5, so let's get right back into uh, continuing on in the chapter. And, of course, we'll be able to conclude the chapter in this lesson. Verse number 6, 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth, but if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Yeshua his Son cleanses us from all sin. So notice the very first word in the passage I just read, if. If is always conditional. Right? There are certain conditions that have to be met. If we say that we have fellowship with him. If we say that, then the result will be that our lives will be changed. Our lives will be changed from the inside out. You will see the change yourself. If someone else claims that they have fellowship with God, that they know God, you will see the change in them as well. And of course, we all have a part to play in that, uh, as far, uh, that, that spiritual maturity. How much time are you in the Word? How much time are you praying? Uh, what Are you using your talents, your spiritual gifts for the edification of the body? Are you attending services? Are you contributing? All of those things go into that. But you'll see the change. You'll see the change from the inside out. John has made mention that God is light. Later on in the letter, he'll say God is love. For now, God is light. And since we know that to be true, and His Holy Spirit abides in us, that light is going to expose the sin in our lives. We may be able to hide those sins from those that are around us, our loved ones, co-workers. We may be able to hide those sins from them. We cannot hide our sins from the Ruach. The Ruach exposes everything. Everything. Um, Haig comments, he says, when someone professes to be a believer in Yeshua, yet their life is characterized by that which is clearly contrary to God's standards, as set forth in his word, their profession of faith is suspect, and there is no assurance that it is true. Evans comments, you are called to walk in the light. You must be willing to let God expose the sin in you, those who walk in the light aren't sinless, but the light enables them to see their sin so they may repent. That's important. None of us are sinless. That's certainly, it's impossible. We're going to continue to sin until we go on home. But the light that is there and is in us is going to expose the sin, and we know it's sin. So, to walk in darkness means to have one's life patterned after sin. Your, your sin is what characterizes you. That's why I've said before, you, a, a believer may commit a homosexual act, but a homosexual cannot be a believer. Because that's what, that's what characterizes, that's what patterns their life. So it's impossible. Now, notice there's a difference between walking in the light and walking according to the light. Notice he says in the light. Walking according to the light all right, is not faith. That's what you call religion, is when you walk according to the light. We do not walk according to the light. We walk in the light because that's our faith. To walk in the light is true believing faith. A born-again experience that you did not earn, you did not make the decision. God did it, and he put his spirit in you. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. You had nothing, and I had nothing to do with our my salvation your salvation. Nothing. He made it all possible. Notice that this fellowship cannot be attained via religion. You cannot have this fellowship by, I think I'll just turn over a new leaf and join a church. No. No. 
It starts from the inside. It's a cleansing from the inside. You've been cleansed. With what? Blood. And the blood cleanses us from all sin. And note is very important. That verb is in the present tense. He doesn't say cleansed us from sin. Which it did. But it's a present tense verb, which means it keeps on cleansing. And that is so important. It keeps on cleansing. Guzik, he comments, he says, The work of Jesus on the cross doesn't only deal with the guilt of sin that might send us to hell. It also deals with the stain of sin, which hinders our continual relationship with God. We need to come to God, often, with the simple plea, Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. Not because we haven't been cleansed before, but because we need to be continually cleansed to enjoy continual relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what the sacrifices and offerings were for. When someone says, well, we don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> well, that, that's, the, that's a picture of the cleansing. That's the picture of confessing one's sins. And bringing those things to him. And understanding that it's his blood that cleanses and continues to do so. It's not, it's not that it just happened once and we don't have to worry about it. Our salvation, our justification, yes. But the cleansing we still continually we need, we need that cleansing. Because of our relationship with him. After the affair with Bathsheba. And then obviously a heinous murder to try and cover that up. You then had Nathan really exposing David. And it wasn't that Nathan showed David something that he didn't know already. David thought he got away with it. And then he comes back, of course, with his prayer of repentance, which we have recorded for us in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4. Listen. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned, and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. This was a believer. A believer telling God, cleanse me from my sin. It's not as if you haven't done it already. I need the cleansing now. Look at what I've done. So David understands once you start lying to others, it won't be long until you start, you start lying to yourself. Burgett, the commentator, he says, to sum up, John's church had fallen on erroneous beliefs, and these led to shortfalls in their community life. Many were living in darkness, not in the sense of disbelief or heinous sins, but rather within a religious context in which they used their beliefs to redefine their need for forgiveness and to separate themselves from others. According to the Apostle, they must be cleansed. John's word for cleansing does not simply imply forgiveness. It suggests the removal of defilement, the elimination of some stain, so that the consequences of that condition no longer have ongoing effects. Cleansing has the future in mind, so that the repairs wrought by God will have permanent results. Perhaps it is good to give darkness a closer definition, of course, it includes wrong doctrine, but it also includes the power of the evil one and his demons. It also includes sin in its many sophisticated forms. Generally speaking, darkness is an atmosphere that denies the truth of God and forbids his light to enter. It is like fog on a sunny morning that is so thick it obscures the way we are driving and makes us wonder if the sun is out at all. Darkness is where God's glory cannot be found. To be sure, Satan creates darkness and is its prince. But we are also capable of doing the same through our fallen choices, 
our deception and our sinfulness. And before long, we become so accustomed to darkness that we forget what true light really is. There's a, 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 a steakhouse not that far away from where we live. And if you walk in there on a, on a sunny afternoon at 1 o'clock or so, right, it, you're walking out of a, of, a, of a bright daylight into that restaurant, uh, it's dark inside, okay? And, and they, they have some nice tables, and they have, like, little lanterns on them and things like that, okay? And it's almost like a shock to the system when you come out from outside into the restaurant. But then guess what happens after a few moments, like two minutes, five minutes? Your eyes become accustomed to the darkness. And at first, when you first walk in, you say, man, is this place dark? After five to ten minutes, it doesn't seem so dark anymore. And they haven't adjusted the lighting any. You're just getting used to the darkness. And you and I as believers, we have to be so careful we don't get used to the darkness. Verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Unfortunately, we live in a culture here in the West that is now proclaiming there is no sin. In a word, really, that's humanism. Okay, There is no sin. The Bible defines what sin is. And so humanism comes along and says, well, you see, the Bible was fine for the era in which it was written. But we're, we're a people who are evolving. We're an evolving creature. And so the Bible, which was written over 2,000 years ago, doesn't apply to us now. It may have been sin then, but it's not sin now. That's humanism. That's a lie. God has already defined what sin is. Hegg writes, he says, there were those making the claim that for them, quote, the sin principle or the depraved nature has been eradicated. That is, those who made such a claim were not saying that they had never sinned but that they had reached a level of enlightenment or spiritual maturity so that they were no longer affected by the sinful nature. Or, to use Paul's terminology, they were no longer affected by the sinful flesh. That's what the Gnostics were saying. You have to achieve this level of spirituality, and you just simply won't sin anymore. And obviously, that is not scriptural. And the, 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 the passages that Tim is talking about, of course, I'll read them to you. Romans 7, 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. He goes on, Romans seven twenty five. Thanks be to God through Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other... With my flesh, the law of sin. Romans thirteen fourteen, But put on the Lord Yeshua the Messiah and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. The Gnostics were making a claim that obviously Paul says you can't, you can't achieve. You cannot achieve a state of sinlessness in this body. Not this body. Not this corruptible. Not this mortality. You cannot. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. And that's the war. And there is a war that abides in each and every one of us, and will continue to do so until we die. Head comments, he said, it may well be that those who had left the believing community had been influenced by Gnostic teachings, which held that through various mystical enlightenments, a person could reach a level of knowledge in which one spirit escaped the clutches of the material world and could therefore exist 
apart from the evils that pervaded the physical realm. In making a clear distinction and separation between the quote-unquote spirit and the quote-unquote body, and positing that evil exists only in the physical realm, one spirit could, through realms of enlightenment, attain an existence of perfection. Whether this philosophical approach to quote-unquote spirituality was what John was combating is not entirely clear, but it may well have been so. And that's simply a false teaching. You cannot achieve sinlessness. Walk in the Spirit, continue to walk in the Spirit, continue to walk in the Spirit, so you don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. But the desire is going to be there. And they always will be. Psalm 51, 5, David continues, Behold, he knows, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Psalm 58, verse 3, The wicked are estranged from the womb. These who speak lies go astray from birth. It's part of our nature. We inherited it from our first parents, Adam and Eve. John says, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. That is a direct shot at Gnosticism. And Haig says it. He says, he writes, for the Gnostics believe that through mystical meditation and special revealed truths, they were able to escape the clutches of the evil material world and ascend to spiritual heights unattainable by any other means. Yet John boldly states that those who have succumbed to such teaching are actually self-deceived and do not know the truth. In charging those who claim to be without sin as being self-deceived, John puts the responsibility squarely upon them, for self-deception is a personal choice to deny the truth. What is more, self-deception inevitably rises from pride and a despising of the humility which comes from acknowledging one's own inability and weakness. This is the essence of spiritual blindness, to believe a lie which nonetheless makes one feel superior because of one's own special knowledge and position. Such spiritual blindness inevitably causes a person to abandon the plain teaching of the scriptures and to live contrary to the revealed truth of God. This is why it is so important to maintain a strong confession of faith in God as he has revealed himself in the scriptures. The inspired word of God is the light by which the child of God is able to discern what is pleasing to him and what is not. It is always the enemy's strategy to diminish the centrality of God's word and to substitute the ideas of mankind as having greater value. Psalm 50, verses 16 and 17, But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to tell of my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth? For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. Now, <laughs> does it seem like God was saying that over 2,000 years ago, or does, the God, does it seem like God is tell, say, telling that to us this very day? It's the same thing. God has defined in his word what is sin. We, as a culture, as a people, we, try to, we, we either redefine sin, or like in our culture now, there is no such thing. And so now, if there is no such thing as sin... Guess what? I can do whatever I want to do, and I can do it without any kind of guilt whatsoever. No guilt, no confession, no forget, none of that. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess. Confess. Interesting. The Greek word there truly means to say the same thing. Hamalageo, to say the same thing. So, this is how you and I, we are to deal with sin in our lives. We confess it, we say it, we repeat it exactly the same way as God does. God has defined it, now we're going to repeat it. Proverbs 28, verse 13, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, 
but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. So now you see, it's important to walk in the light so the light can expose the dirt that's in our lives. You have to walk in the light. You have to get into your Bible. The Bible is where is what defines sin. Otherwise, your own understanding will take what sin is and turn it into something which it's not, which is permissible. So let's get back to the word confession. If we confess our sins, confession is more than admitting. It's more than admitting. You run through a red light, you get pulled over, you look at the cop. Yeah, I, I know I ran through the red light, but... Well, yeah, you admitted what you did. That's not confession. <laughs> confession is when you say the very same thing about your sin as God has said about your sin. That's confession. Wearsby writes, he says, Confession is not praying a lovely prayer or making pious excuses, or trying to impress God and other Christians. True confession is naming sin, calling it by name what God calls it. Envy, hatred, lust, deceit, or whatever it may be. Confession simply means being honest with ourselves and with God, and if others are involved, being honest with them too. It is more than admitting sin. It means judging sin and facing it squarely. So confession and not denial, that should be the characteristic of a born-again believer. When you see somebody sinning or hear about a sin, and they're making excuses for it over and over, and never actually confessing it and calling what calling their sin what God calls it. Is that person then saved? No. Cannot be. When because the Holy Spirit that resides in you is going to expose the sin for what it is, because it's going the Holy Spirit is going to work in operation with his word. And it's going to show you the word, and the Spirit's going to, going to point the finger at the very thing that you did, and the very thing I did, and call it for what it is. At that point, we confess it. I'm going to confess the sin before God, because that's what God has called it, a sin. Now, listen carefully to this quote by Guzik, and then we'll go over it again. All right, hold on. He writes, Our sins are not forgiven because we confess. If this were the case, if forgiveness for a sin could only come where there was confession, then we would all be damned because it would be impossible for us to confess every sin we ever commit. Let me read, it, uh, read that again. Our sins are not forgiven because we confess. If this were the case, if forgiveness for a sin could only come where there was a confession, then we would all be damned because it would be impossible for us to confess every sin we ever commit. There are sins that you and I commit. We don't even know we're doing it. Yet his blood has paid for them. Now at this point you may be thinking, right, and this is going unfortunately down the line of many, many Christian teachings. Well, see, now it's all grace, it's all grace, and so really, it's almost as if, what's the sense in confessing anymore? You, Jesus died on the cross for all your sins. Well, yes, that is true, but you still have to confess. Following our confession, God will forgive because it is in his nature to do so. Isaiah 1, verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. 2 Timothy 2, verse 13, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And this is where the wonderful, amazing grace of God comes in. How many times have, listen, you, you, you've done something to somebody, you, you, you offended somebody, whatever. And you come to that person and you say, listen, can we have a talk? Yes. 
I am really sorry for what I did. I, please accept my apology. And the person looked at you and said, don't worry about it. I've already forgiven you. Now, you needed to do that. You needed to come to that person for yourself, for the other person. But the person has already forgiven you. God has already forgiven us for our sins. He, he cannot, because of the blood of Yeshua on the cross, He cannot hold them against you. Like Guzik said, otherwise we would be damned. So your sins are forgiven. All of them. All of them you have ever committed. All of them you ever will. But that doesn't mean we still don't come to Him and confess. Because you want to restore the fellowship. David lost his fellowship. He didn't lose his salvation, but he lost the fellowship. Heg writes, he says, Therefore, to confess our sins to God as a regular part of our growing love for him is to act in accordance with, with who we are in Messiah. For in confessing our sins, we agree with God about what sin is, and by the act of confession, we affirm again that he has forgiven our sins through the work of his Son. Thus, confession of sins flows from a growing love for God who has redeemed us, brought us into his family, and given the promise of eternal life. Unbelievers don't confess their sins to God. Only believers do. Romans eight twenty nine and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. Do you see that? That's why you and I were saved by God. That's why he chose you, that's why he called you, and he saved you, in order to conform you into the image of his Son. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called, and with these whom he called, he also justified, and with these whom he justified, he also glorified. In the sovereign plan of God, God always intended for you and me to be in his family. And in order to do that, he had to send his only begotten son to die for our sins on, on, on our behalf. Last verse, verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. If someone dared to say they have never sinned, in essence what you're really saying is they're making themselves equal with God. God has stated, all have sinned. So if someone says they haven't, in essence what they're calling God is a liar. Because God says all have sinned. Psalm 14, verse 3, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Not even one. Uh I hadn't given it much thought. I think it's Burge in his commentary brings this up, and it's interesting to, to talk about, certainly not in the scope of, of this lesson. But the Protestant tradition, he mentions, demands, which I will agree with, a public profession of our faith, right? You must publicly profess your faith, like you come before the church or the congregation, what have you. But he notices something. He says, why is it that the Protestant tradition demands a public profession of our faith, but not a public confession of our sins? That's an interesting question. Especially when, especially when, and we know this to be true, not our sins just aren't committed against God and is going to hurt our fellowship with him. Obviously that happens. Our sins affect the entire body. And in some cases, yes, our sins are going to affect the local congregation. So it's a, it's a, it's a probing question. If the church, most churches demand, and rightfully so, a public profession of your faith, what about a public confession of your sins? especially against the congregation. And so his point is, the result of this, is that too many Christians have lost sight of the need to confess their sins at all. And so, hey, it's all, it's all washed by the blood. And there's no confession. 
And people just sin and just keep on moving and sin and keep on moving and sin. And, and it ne- those sins are never brought before the throne of God. This is what I've done, Lord, please forgive me. This is what I've done to this church. This is what I've done to this congregation. My mouth has done this. My actions have done this, whatever it is. And I'm asking, I've already asked God for forgiveness. I ask you for the same. And anybody who has ever done that, by the way, and you confess your sins to another person, this is what I've done. I've already asked for God to forgive me. And now I ask you for that. Do you know what that does? It's liberating. It is so liberating to do that to come to somebody and say please forgive me this is what I've done and I was wrong it is so liberating it frees you it so frees you final passage for the evening Psalm 32 verses 1 through 5 how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. That is a beautiful ending. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Well, on that note, we have finished up 1 John chapter 1, and when we get back together, we'll start digging in on chapter 2.